The second part of our dynamic memory allocation uh, lecture is really concerned with uh, a few aspects looking at garbage collection and a short little bit on, on object pools. So we'll start off first of all with uh, garbage collection. Garbage collection, it's, it's a feature, a facility that is built into to manage languages. It's one of the, the, the defining characteristics of what makes a managed language, that there is garbage collection within it. Um, the advantage of garbage collection is that if we allocate an object, so create a, a new array or a new instance of a class, we don't need to worry about how it gets to be created and allocated within memory, how it gets to be released or removed from memory. So all of the memory management aspects are are managed on our behalf. And the garbage collection process is the one that is responsible for going through all of our allocated data or objects and our arrays and working out when they are they're free, they, they're not being used anymore. They, if you like, the, the memory associated with them can be released and, and reused and reallocated. Um, how does it do that? So in languages like Java and C Sharp, yes, we, we will write our programs ourselves. You actually have a separate thread, uh, and if you like another program running alongside yours in the background. It's generally a low priority background thread, you can you can up it if you want, you can tell it to, to work explicitly. Um, but whenever there's a quiet period within your program, then this thread kicks into action. And it, it scans through memory looking for objects or chunks of, of, of memory that's been allocated that is not currently being used. You have nothing in your program referring to it, effectively it's orphaned memory. And if it finds that, then it deletes it, it frees it up and enables that memory to be reused. A common one of the, there's lots of different approaches you can use to to manage garbage collections. Effectively, it's, it's an algorithm. Um, there's different algorithms you can use. Mark and sweep is one of the uh, more common algorithms to use for garbage collection. Effectively, here it's managed language, so we will have a list of of pointers or references, if you like, that are active within your program. And the mark component is that you you go through your list of of references that are our pointers. We're already going to look at it that you have defined. They will identify certain objects that have been allocated, and you then mark those objects. You say, okay, this pointer is is referring to and using this particular object as marked. Um, so you go through and you mark it for them. Second one is the sweep process. You then scan through all of the objects that you have allocated, the data you've allocated on your heap, and if you find something, an object on the heap, that isn't marked, so nothing has claimed or said, oh, by the way, I'm using that, then you free it up. You release that memory. Um, you, you may or may not be taking actions based on that release, um, and you may or may not want to then restructure or rejig the memory after you've done your sweep to sort of remove holes from it. If we wanted to implement a mark and sweep garbage collection process in C++, over on the right hand side you get a high level overview of what actually we would need to, to do to accomplish this. And this will give you, I suppose, hopefully a reasonable insight into to what Java and C Sharp do by way of uh, their structure and by way of their operation. So there's two components to this, design and then uh, design changes design time and then run time, what we do when the program is running. So at design time, the changes we need to make to uh, our, our, our program before we run it. We have to require all objects that we create to extend a common base class. There must be one super class that every single object um, extends. Uh, and that actually is the case within Java and C Sharp. Uh, all of our objects, even if we don't explicitly say so, every single object extends a um, an object superclass. The reason we do that, the reason we, if we have a single base class, is that we can provide some common functionality within that um, uh, base class. And it means then that for this case we can mark these objects. Also, we need to ensure that we are allocating an array, that they are wrapped within an enclosing class. Now, the, the way that we've been looking at allocating so far in C++ create 
what's known as raw arrays. They are just simply chunks of allocated memory. If we're looking at a wrapped array, what we're saying there is that we will create a class and within that class you will have a raw array, a chunk of allocated data, but that array class will, will sort of enclose that, will embody it, will, will provide constructors, will provide destructors, will provide, um, if you like, a range of, of methods that can be used um, to, to access and to manage that chunk of raw data. Uh, so if we want to, to implement garbage collection, then we need to have that common base class. We need to make sure that we're not using raw arrays. And these are design decisions that Java and C Sharp actually do put in place. Second design decision, we have to use reference counting smart pointers. Basically, we have to use smart pointers. Um, we're not using raw pointers. Raw pointers, just a memory location. A smart pointer, yes, points to a location within memory, but it's a small object in its own right. It embodies some other functionality. It maybe knows how many other things are pointing to it. Um, it can take an action if it gets to be deleted or goes out of scope. Given those design time uh, decisions and then given a program that's implemented on top of these, at runtime there's a couple of, of processes that we need to do. Every once in a while, and you, you would decide what every once in a while actually means, you would run a garbage collection process. Now you could have this as a background thread, you could explicitly call it at certain intervals, just depends on how you want to do it. Within uh, the, the garbage collection process, we will have a look at all of our smart pointers that are registered uh, that we have available within it. We'll go through and, and we will um, also know, because we're managing the allocation of data as well, we will know what objects, what areas we have allocated on our heap, and we do the marking process at that point. Then after that, we do the sweep process. We go through our heap and we work out, OK, which ones are not marked, free up that memory, and then decide, do we want to reorganize the memory on the heap uh, to avoid any, any holes? So it's not, um, I mean, it's not an impossible thing to do in C++, and, and quite a lot of the C++11 is sort of looking at giving uh, this level of, of, of management, but there is a good amount of, of effort involved in, in sort of providing this garbage collection uh, process. Now, a couple of obvious advantages of a, of a, of a garbage collector. Uh, in principle, if you're using, if you're automating the process of garbage collection and not assuming the programmer will remember to do it themselves, you avoid memory leaks. Um, correctly written garbage collector, you'll not have memory leaks. It'll free things up more or less. Importantly, it frees up the programmer from what is a rather mundane housekeeping task. Uh, says to the programmer that, you know what, you don't need to worry about these low-level aspects about allocation and deallocation. Uh, you can instead think about higher level aspect, whatever it is you're trying to realize, the functionality you're trying to bring together. So it lets the programmer devote more of their mental activity, if you like, to, to higher level, presumably more um, sort of business valued uh, pieces or, or pieces of functionality. The main disadvantage, and this is an avoidable disadvantage, the main disadvantage, and, and you see this, I have to admit, quite a lot in, in Java and C Sharp for uh, people who are learning it the first time. Because the garbage collector is an invisible process, it happens in the background, it happens automatically, it is very easy to take it for granted, to forget that look, it, just, it just does its job. That's dangerous. Um, because it's possible then that in Java and C Sharp you can write fragments of code that will put a very heavy burden on the garbage collector, um, that will allocate a whole bunch of data that will be very short-lived, um, so it gets to be allocated very shortly thereafter you go to the garbage collector and it has to do all the hard work of freeing it up. Um, now, even though then the, the, the garbage collector is, is managing looking after this yourself, you're still running on the same device and this is still occupying uh, CPU resources on that device and, and sort of consuming the available um, uh, performance that you have uh, uh, on, the, the, on the device itself. So in Java and C Sharp, if you 
don't take the garbage collector into mind. You can write programs that fundamentally run slow. In C++, you generally don't see that because if you are forced to actually deal with the hassle of deallocating these things yourself, then the cost is apparent because you're the one who's having to incur, oh, I've got to make sure I delete this and delete that. Um, so garbage collector, good thing, is what you want to do. The most important thing to bring away from this is do not take it for granted. Um, appreciate that it can take a long time to do this and ideally write our code in a manner that doesn't put a heavy burden upon the garbage collector if that burden is avoidable. Object pools, um, I'm going to finish on this as, as very a quick aside. This actually provides a very capable way of avoiding garbage collection cost. So if you find yourself in a position where you realize, hold on, we are creating and deleting a lot of objects and this is something that's putting a heavy burden on the garbage collector, then an object pool generally provides you with a good solution to that. Uh, and I'm not going to say much here. I mean, you'll see examples of them implemented within the course, just simply outline the, uh, the purpose of it. Basically, an object pool gives you a way of managing temporary objects, short-lived objects. Uh, and the idea is that you allocate a whole bunch of them at the start. You use them. But whenever you've finished using them, you don't discard them. That memory isn't freed up. Instead, you go and you insert them, if you like, within your object pool. Something still holds onto that data. Something still has access to it. Then whenever an object comes back or an, another process comes in and wants to get one of these temporary objects, it can go to the object pool and say, okay, can you give me one, please? And the object pool can give it access to one of the objects that it contains. So it provides a way of recycling them. And you know, you can see an example over on, on the right-hand side, the diagram for, for bowling, of a, a real-world object pool, um, where you may have a, a pair of bowling shoes, where people can collect them, use them, and then return them, um, for potentially for somebody else then to, to pick up and to reuse them themselves. Object pools, there's lots of things you can do within this. You can have fixed size ones, you can have ones that dynamically grow, um, lots of nice things you can do with them. So we have summary on this one here. Uh, C Sharp, Java, they have garbage collection automatic memory management built in. C++ doesn't have it. You have to do it yourself. If you wanted to, you could put uh, it, it in automatically within um, C++. Don't take for granted uh, the garbage collector. So it is something that we want to, to minimize the amount of time and uh, effort that it requires to do its job. An unusual thing here that is important, we, we ideally want to have good garbage management, uh, good garbage collection within our programs because this is a key way of avoiding memory leaks.